good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Ahmed El Bambi. I'm a professor of petroleum engineering uh, in the uh, petroleum engineering and petroleum and energy engineering department at the AUC. And uh, last month, I took over the uh, chairmanship from Dr. Amr Srag, In fact, uh, what I will do in uh, in the few minutes. Actually, I forgot that uh, I traded a few minutes with Dr. Amr, but I will make myself uh, brief. Uh, what we'll do in the next few minutes is um, a quick narrative of oil and gas sector in Egypt, and then I would like to introduce the um, petroleum engineering uh, program at AUC to lead for the uh, proposal that I will make at the end. Um, so we're looking at uh, a press uh, release uh, in 1909. Uh, uh, that was the press uh, release that was uh, announcing the uh, first discovery of uh, oil in Egypt. And uh, interestingly, uh, a group of investors, um, the, um, uh, the company name is Egyptian Oil Trust Limited. Uh, it was established in 1907 uh, with capital of 100,000 sterling pounds. They spent half of this capital to drill uh, several wells until they got this uh, nice uh, discovery in the eastern desert of, uh, of Egypt. Uh, in comparison, what we do now in the uh, uh, Mediterranean is um, we drill wells for 150 to 250 million dollars each. Uh, this second picture here is the uh, uh, first discovery uh, in Sinai, 1946, in uh, Ras Sudri field, and this field is still produces until today. Uh, in Egypt, if we look at the uh, history, we uh, we have gone through. Uh, variation uh, like many mature countries in uh, in the oil industry uh, so we have gone through uh, maturation process in the um, uh, petroleum agreement so before 1962 we had the royalty and tax system which is actually the implemented system now in the US uh, from uh, 63 until 72 we had the participation system in which the investor and the country uh, they share uh, the expenses for the development of uh, of oil fields. Uh, starting 1972 and onward, we started uh, implementing the production sharing agreements. Uh, and in these agreements, the investor will take over the, um, uh, the expenses for uh, exploration and development for cost recovery at the end, plus uh, some profit oil uh, or gas. Uh, this is actually a, a picture of the uh, first production sharing agreement that was signed in uh, uh, ratified by the parliament and signed in uh, 1974 by uh, President Sadat back then. Uh, the many agreements uh, that Egypt made with uh, foreign investors, uh, around 500 agreements, in fact, uh, uh, over the years, uh, starting from the production sharing agreement, has led to um, very large infrastructure in Egypt that includes eight refineries, several uh, petrochemical plants, 31 gas plants. Uh, of particular interest to Greece, Cyprus, and Egypt is the last two, uh, which are the two uh, liquefied natural gas uh, plants that are underutilized at the moment. Uh, in addition to that, there is a large crude oil and um, uh, products uh, network, network of pipelines, and there is the national uh, gas grid. Uh, uh, I think now it reached uh, more than 7,000 kilometers of uh, gas pipelines connecting uh, different uh, regions in the country. So the infrastructure is there. Uh, this is basically the uh, national uh, gas grid, the gas pipelines. Uh, having the infrastructure uh, leads to uh, putting the uh, discoveries on production uh, very quick, very quickly. And uh, a prominent example of, of that is uh, Zohri Field, uh, which will be put in production in a little, uh, a little over two years, in comparison to five to eight years for comparable uh, projects. Um, since we're talking about the history, so this is the historical production of uh, Egypt, uh, represented by the operating companies uh, in Egypt. So on the, um, uh, the y-axis, we have uh, the uh, amount of oil production in barrels, oil equivalent per day, uh, versus years here. 
and of particular uh, interest to this gathering is the Nile Delta. So this is the production from the Nile Delta and Mediterranean. And as we can see, the production is declining at the moment, uh, ready to take uh, Zohr and any other uh, new discoveries or discoveries from uh, neighbor countries as well. Um, this slide shows the um, uh, OPEX and CAPEX uh, comparisons between uh, developing uh, different uh, regions in Egypt, Gulf of Suez and Western Desert and Nile Delta or the Mediterranean versus other uh, countries in the region and elsewhere. So still uh, competitive uh, when it comes to economics, uh, Egypt provinces are still competitive in today's environment of low oil prices. Um, speaking about the industry, uh, I have to talk a little bit about the uh, petroleum engineering education in Egypt. So um, our first graduates as petroleum engineers graduated from Cairo University back in 1947. Uh, currently, there are six petroleum engineering departments in the, uh, in the country. Uh, I work for AUC at the moment, and the program in, uh, at the AUC uh, started in uh, 2009. Uh, I understand uh, it is not easy to establish uh, petroleum engineering uh, programs uh, everywhere because uh, actually the infrastructure uh, for the department is not the problem, but the faculty is the problem. Uh, for the AUC, for our uh, department, we, uh, since the establishment, establishment of the department, we have gone through uh, some uh, curriculum changes, but we always had in mind uh, this uh, uh, ideal petroleum engineering graduate uh, idea that was published in the uh, SP in 2005. Uh, and um, basically, if you, without going into a lot of details, uh, we emphasize the uh, core engineering skills, petroleum engineering skills, and also uh, communication and uh, liberal arts uh, education. For the facilities parts, we, uh, we have very nice uh, facilities, uh, full-fledged uh, drilling simulator, uh, PVT cells, uh, uh, core holders, etc., etc. So we have like five uh, uh, well-equipped labs that we use for uh, our undergraduate uh, program. I'm fortunate to work with um, uh, world-class uh, faculty. Uh, most of them come with many years uh, industry experience in uh, leading uh, petroleum companies. And as I said, this is actually the problem in establishing uh, petroleum uh, engineering uh, departments. It's not the equipment, it is actually the, uh, the faculty. Uh, you see on the uh, upper two pictures here, our students uh, going for uh, one day field visits, uh, of course, in addition to industrial uh, training, they go for one, one day uh, field visits to look at equipment and work with the equipment that we cannot host uh, inside the uh, university. Uh, the bottom picture here shows Dr. Amra and myself uh, welcoming uh, a delegation from the uh, industry. It was Slumberger this time. Uh, we also emphasize the students' activities. So um, uh, you see the uh, upper picture here, uh, Farah Fawzi, uh, senior student, uh, winning the uh, regional student paper contest for the undergraduate uh, that was held in Bahrain uh, in the spring. And she's competing next month uh, at the international student paper contest uh, in San Antonio. Uh, this is the first time we have a female student going uh, to that level uh, in the uh, international competition and she's the second uh, student from Egypt to uh, win that title. Uh, the bottom picture shows Farah, Ola and Abdul Aziz. The, this is, uh, these are also students, senior students from our department who are going to compete in the international, uh, uh, we call it Petro Bowl competition uh, next month. This brings me to my last slide, which is the uh, proposal. As I said, uh, it's very difficult to establish a petroleum engineering department and actually for sustainable uh, integration and cooperation between uh, or among the three countries, uh, if, we can f uh, if we can make sure that the, uh, our future leaders and your future leaders become friends at the college level, uh, that will uh, 
uh, ensure the sustainability of any cooperation in the future. So the proposal basically is to, um, uh, and I will leave this to, uh, to the discussion, if we can think of ways to fund the students from Greece and Cyprus uh, to come and study at the uh, AUC with our students, uh, that will actually be very nice on the, uh, on the long term. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed Bambi, and thank you for being uh, very punctual at the time. Thank you very much. I call on Dr. Theodoris Tsakiris. Tsakiris, Assistant Professor, Energy Policy and Geopolitics, UNIC, and Senior Fellow at the Center for Energy Policy at UNIC. The floor is yours, sir. taking it out of my time. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Dean Fahmi, Dr. Magda. Yes, all right. I'd like to thank you very much for this very honorable invitation. Um, the University of Nicosia, I'm, I'm working at the University of Nicosia since 2013. I am teaching oil and gas economics and geopolitics at the university, and I'm also the head of all the business schools programs at the graduate and undergraduate level on oil and gas economics. Um, what I'm going to try to do with the allotted time that I have is try to give you an overview of the region and the specific projects, especially with regarding natural gas and electricity, that could be of a common interest for, for the three countries, especially with regards to the one which is the most viable and the most economically sound, which is basically to export the entire net export capacity of the Aphrodite field to Damietta and uh, start exports to Europe within the next two or three years, before the end of this decade. And this is the, basically the most tangible proposal that we have and that would allow the beginning of, of Cypriot exports and East Med exports in general to European market destinations before the end of this decade, at least, well, close to, or close to the end or at 2020. Now, since 2008, the last 10 years, which basically we take as a, as a landmark 2008, the discovery of Tamar Field in Israel, in the Israeli Exclusive Economic Zone, which was the first new major discovery of the region, because before that, all the discoveries were made in the Exclusive Economic Zone of Egypt. Um, since for, fast forward 10 years from to today, basically seen that the region has been shaped by the following major major parameters. The first one has been the shifting of Egypt from a, ma from a significant net exporter back to a net importing position that is currently being reversed after the discovery of Atoll and Zor. By the, before the end of the decade, Egypt would again... Egypt would become... Is it better? Egypt would become... A net, uh, uh, would become again self-sufficient in its own gas demand, even though it is expanding very rapidly. The second characteristic has been uh, the fact that uh, Israel, Israel is developing as a major net exporting capacity country with a net exporting capacity of about 400 billion cubic meters. And also the fact that Cyprus is also developing as a potentially very significant net exporting country, which at the time it doesn't work, which at the time, which at the time it only has one discovery, Aphrodite, but that discovery is already 25% of Israel's entire net export capacity. The difference between Cyprus and Israel is that the entire, the entire demand of Cyprus is so limited that we can already, we, with current reserves, Aphrodite reserves, we have the capacity to cover our own demand for the next 20 to 25 years. So 90% of Aphrodite, the, the, the smaller discovery was mentioned before, on Isiphoros A, which was a 0 0.4 trillion cubic feet field. Aphrodite is 4.5 trillion cubic feet field. And anything f other than that, has and is to be exported. That is something unique 
for Cyprus and the region if, of course, those discoveries are made within 2008. In 2008, 2019, there are five planned drilling, drilling exploratory drillings in the currently defined exclusive economic zone of Cyprus, starting in July 2018 with uh, the, the two drillings, two exploratory drillings by Exxon in Block 10. And this is where most indications are that we hope, inshallah, to find our own war. Because these, if we do find it, it would be big. We don't know, we are not sure, but if we do find it, it would be a zor size or a Leviathan size field. Um, moreover, after Zor, what we're seeing generally in the region as a trend is that we're moving because of, of the discoveries and what that discovery meant for, for the region, especially for Cyprus, into a more positive expectation about the region's prospective reserves. It's not over, it doesn't stop with Zor or Leviathan. Most of the region is still completely unexplored. There are very big parts of the exclusive economic zone of Egypt currently defined because there are issue, parts of it which are not yet defined with regards to Cyprus and more importantly Greece. And it's demarcation with further exploratory efforts in, that regard, in this regard. And um, also 50% of Israel's exclusive economic zone is not discovered. And in Cyprus we've only had basically four exploratory wells of which we've had two out of four discoveries. One significant one, one less significant. So the rate, as petroleum drills know, is very, very good. Because usually when you drill, you expect not to find anything by 75%, not to find something. So the expectations are quite important. The, something which has, uh, to a certain extent, limited our optimism has to do with economic conditions currently in European markets. Demand in Europe over the last 10 years, the year the period under review, has dropped by more than 120 billion cubic meters. And it is dropped by 100 million cubic meters because Europe is a, it has become very, very successful within the, before the penetration of its renewable energy and electricity, the increase of its electricity and gas interconnectivity, especially with the eastern part of the Union and the southeastern part of the Union, which is still something that needs to be finalized by, by the end of the decade. It will be finalized. And also of, of a relative uh, res resilience of the nuclear electricity industry production in Europe, which is something that few people expect it to be the case after the Fukushima accident of 2011. And despite the fact that Germany and Switzerland are phasing it out, Eastern European countries and other countries are still uh, holding on that very significant part of the electricity mix. So demand for gas and prices for gas, including prices for LNG to Europe, which, was, which is one of, the, of the, the best, if not the most important markets for our potential gas exports to the European Union, is, is saturated at present day. Demand is expected to pick up by the beginning of the next decade. And demands and exports are going to be needed, more exports are going to be needed, primarily as a result of, of two factors. The first one is that current conventional production in Europe is declining very, very steeply, very, very rapidly. Over the last 10 years, European producers, which had a significant part of their demand covered by domestic production, have lost anywhere between 50 to 70 percent of current production rates, so it's it diminishing very, very rapidly. And despite uh, you know, ideas and concepts that you could take the shale gas revolution of the United States and apply it in Europe, have met reality, which means that they're not going anywhere. The, 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 the level of unconventional gas production in Europe is minimal, and it's not likely that you're going to see a, a, a significant production increase by, by that. So imports are going to increase. The next question is, from where? Okay. And there is an issue of, of a certain, and there comes our link with the region. The region is important not only because of its net export capacity. The region is important because it could offer a serious diversification, positive, a, positive, a serious, seriously positive diversification effect on current EU strategies uh, with regards to limiting our dependence on, on Russian gas. Is it competitive enough compared to Russian gas? It depends. 
Currently, not entirely, obviously. The, the, the major strategic advantage Russia has and Gazprom has vis a all of us is that it's been producing and completing the infrastructure for decades. Okay. There are no green gas fields anymore. Everything has been producing for decades. They've sunk in the cost. They've recaptured the cost. They have a very, very strong marketing, marketing position vis-a-vis -vis existing and future, and future clients and markets. But having said that, the European Union is starting to become serious when it comes to actually putting its money where its mouth is. And that for, for European policy issues is something very important and very rare. And it is beginning to do so because as, as, the, European, as the European energy policy is becoming very closely uh, uh, connected with European environmental targets, we are moving away, regardless of what Mr. Trump is going to do, we are moving away from a high carbon footprint in our energy mix. And it is impossible due to, to existing uh, technical restrictions on the ability of RS, RS produced electricity to be able to cover all this future demand from less uh, polluting fossil fuels from renewable energy sources alone. So a very big part is going to come from, from gas, and a smaller part is going to come from nuclear energy, nuclear, nuclear generated electricity. So the region can play a significant role in this regard. We need to wait for prices to, to increase for some destinations. We need to wait for demand to pick up. But since these contracts are going to be long-term contracts, contracts which can last for 10, 15 years into the future, the way that we negotiate the pricing mechanism would offer both demand security and supply security to both parties so that this project could become bankable today. <coughs> I completely agree with, with the proposal put forward by, by, Mr. Uh, by President Papadopoulos in this regard, because basically I don't understand why do we have to wait to find everything when we have something that can work now. And that's something for Cyprus, by the way, is costing us 200 million euros per year in excess fuel costs that we have to import to generate electricity. An island which has failed in its RES policy, which has abundant sun, some wind, and only 4% of its electricity from renewable energy sources. So within this context, the way to move forward with regards to existing reserves in the region, for me, is first to go to Danieta. Why Danieta? Because it's much cheaper to build a pipeline to connect the fields from the extreme economic zone of Cyprus to Danieta. It's half the cost than connecting them to Itku. And Danieta, we can fill them by, them by ourselves alone. We don't need any third party to participate. And that third party, obviously, is Israel, as situations are today. We can go forward by ourselves. If Israeli companies would want to join, we are very welcome. But we don't have to wait for them to do something that we can do as quickly as possible. That would be the opening door to a serious diversification, uh, to, to a serious supply diversification for Europe. And that is something the European Union and the energy union project within the European Union are going to be able to transfer to something more tangible in, in terms of EU financial support for building an Eastnet pipeline once prices, reserves, and demand a rebound to what they used to be at least before the financial crisis began in Europe in 2010. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sakiris, for a very interesting and succinct uh, presentation. I call on Dr. Konstantinos Fidis, and I promise you all an excellent presentation because I have everything I know in this sector. I have heard from him in a presentation a few years ago. Uh, so it's a, with great pleasure that I, uh, I introduce uh, Dr. Konstantinos Fidis, Director of Research at the Institute for International Relations at the Pantheon University. Uh, uh, and he will speak to us about uh, a potential supplier of the EU and the role of Greece in uh, the Eastern Med. Thank you. Thank you very much for the good words. Uh, of course, being a friend, uh, everybody in the audience should know that uh, your approach is uh, very much subjective. But in any case, uh, I will uh, uh, welcome the, the good words um, about me. So, um, I am the last of uh, uh, 
uh, following actually three uh, very uh, prominent speakers. I will try to be uh, uh, brief, uh, as brief as possible, and I will uh, immediately uh, cut to the uh, chase. Um, I will start by uh, portraying EU's vulnerability uh, in the energy game, particularly in that of the natural gas, uh, then I will, uh, which opens a window of opportunity for uh, Eastern Mediterranean countries, and then I will turn into the linkage between Europe and the Eastern Mediterranean, concluding with Greece's usefulness as a transit hub, and with a couple of suggestions on how to further enhance trilateral cooperation. Uh, four observations uh, concerning the European market. The first one is that the future of EU gas demand is uncertain, but will likely remain stagnant. In 2000, as you can see, the European Union consumed 500 BCM uh, on an annual basis. Uh, this uh, dropped in 2016 to 440, and then uh, it is estimated that it will reach 460 BCM uh, in uh, 2040. Uh, taking the, into consideration what uh, my good friend Fodoros uh, mentioned, uh, that is uh, the uh, dramatic rise in renewables, uh, energy conservation as well, uh, both of which top the list of priorities uh, for the European Union. At the same time, indigenous production will continue to decline and there is no progress on shale gas uh, in sight. Uh, from, uh, 20, uh, from 260 BCM in 2000, internal consumption falling uh, 140 BCM, and it is expected to further uh, decline to 100 uh, BCM in 2040. What's more, requirement for natural gas imports will grow. In 2000, we, as uh, Europeans, uh, imported 240 uh, billion cubic meters, in 2016, the imports grew to 280, and in 2040, as you can see, uh, it is expected to rise to 370 BCM. So in 2040, uh, the European uh, market uh, will import 370 billion cubic meters. Also, there is another uh, trend. Uh, today, we uh, import 68% uh, of the natural gas that we consume as the EU of 28. In the coming years, probably 27 member states. And in 2040, uh, the uh, expectation is that we will need to import 85 at least percent of the natural gas that we will be uh, consuming. As for the EU's future gas supply gap, in 2030, we expect that more than 100 billion cubic meters of new supply is required from non-traditional sources. Breaking this 107 BCM of supply gap into three, there is an extra 40 BCM of demand added with 17 BCM of lesser imports and 50 BCM of the drop in domestic production. Now, let me turn into the Eastern Mediterranean. I am sure you're all aware that diversification has been a constant priority for the EU, both of suppliers, so as to lessen dependence in Russia, and of transport countries in order to avoid a new Ukraine. Given that Azerbaijan's Production is lower than was expected, particularly at the eve of uh, the 1990s. Turkmenistan is oriented towards the Asian market, and particularly China. The Iranian option faces restrictions and complications. The Kurdish part of Iraq is affected by regional turbulence. And American LNG will be mainly directed to Asia and has yet to prove its price competitiveness. The Eastern Mediterranean region is an emerging and promising alternative for Europe. Its proven reserves are twice uh, these of Azerbaijan, as you can see in the map, and its undiscovered reserves are estimated at 10 TCM, that is trillion cubic meters, which is five times more than the Norwegian ones and nearly one third of Russian reserves.
The gas production in the region is estimated to reach 160 BCM in 2035, with Egypt producing close to 110 BCM, though at least uh, given nowadays discoveries, its demand for gas is expected to absorb the output of its considerable gas resources. However, including Cypriot and Israeli natural gas, the volumes available for exports will be between 30 and 45 uh, uh, BCM beginning from 2015. Irrespective of the geographic proximity and the obvious need, in my point of view, to bind Egypt with the European uh, Union, not only politically, but also economically, some of you may wonder why I have excluded the Asian market from the equation. Well, the global market, and even more the Asian LNG market, is expected to lose its attractiveness uh, um, since in uh, 2020. Even more new sources, as you can see, uh, will come online. That is Australia, East Africa, uh, namely Mozambique and uh, Tanzania, Western Canada, the United States. These are becoming major competitors for the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, as far as the Asian uh, LNG market is concerned. And they will definitely go to capitalize on their proximity to their target market, that is mainly uh, China uh, and India. Then the question would be where Greece fits in and what are the advantages of this option? Before I uh, elaborate on that, we shall explore the export options for East Med gas based on today's estimations. These are, first, to Turkey, which is the biggest regional market uh, through a connection by pipe. Second, in LNG form via the existing Egyptian um, LNG uh, facilities. Third is through the East Med undersea pipeline to Europe. And fourth, it's to the European market via Turkey. I would also like to underline that the exportable surplus of Israel and Cypriot gas, not to add the Egyptian, if we assume that the bulk of Zor field will go for internal consumption, is sufficient to support multiple export options. However, each alternative involves different risk profiles. If Turkey, for instance, is involved in the transportation of natural gas in the transportation of natural gas to Europe, a number of doubts arises, as it will not only embed Turkey's uncertainties in the project, but would also be geopolitically one-sided, as it would increase Ankara's strength exclusively and increase its sway with producers. It's having the additional role of transiting country rather than being merely a customer. This will give it a negotiating advantage over Brussels, multiplying the potential risks deriving from its management of this advantage. Furthermore, the creation of a new inland pipeline, we, we need a new inland pipeline. There is a Turkish propaganda which says that uh, it, is, uh, it, it doesn't cost much to connect uh, obviously doesn't cost much to connect uh, the uh, Israeli uh, energy fields and maybe uh, the Cypriot, but of course we need a resolution in the uh, Cypriot issue uh, before that takes place. But yes, there is a very uh, a close geographic proximity. It doesn't cost much to reach Turkey, but there are no interconnectors within the Turkey soil that can take natural gas from its southern borders and transport it to Europe, which means that we need a new pipeline system, which entails that we need money to do that. Um, the other scenario uh, for an undersea pipeline is the East Med. Um, but since we're talking about trilateral cooperation, I won't get into detail about this project. I will only stress that first, despite some technical difficulties, it is a feasible project. Second, it can deliver up to 16 BCM on an annual basis to Europe. And third, 
it can also incorporate new quantities from possible discoveries uh, in the south of Crete. The second option is the uh, utilization of the uh, liquefaction facilities in Egypt. In that case, regional producers could more economically send a portion of their production to, Euro to Egypt where their gas will be liquefied and be exported as LNG. We can see that here, the Damietta in Itku, uh, Fodoros uh, referred to uh, Damietta uh, very correctly. Um, then, and as long, of course, as the situation remains uh, stable in Egypt, the risk is really low. Then, Greece can serve as the gateway to Europe and could very well receive LNG in its two by then terminals, that is the Revithusa terminal and the under construction uh, terminal in Alexandrupoli, which is a, a FSRU. Uh, the existent in Revithusa uh, terminal has a capacity of seven, this is the one, of, seven, of five to seven BCM, while the upcoming FSRU in Alexandrupolis, in northern Greece, uh, can host between three to six uh, billion cubic meters. The latter's added value is its connection with a vertical corridor, that is the IGB, the Interconnector Greece-Bulgaria. This is a vertical corridor uh, through the uh, IGB pipeline that can transport up to 5 BCM, not only to southeastern Europe, but uh, also parts of eastern Europe like Hungary. This project, through the uh, already existing interconnectors, can even reach Austria. The comparative advantage of the involvement of two EU member states, that is Greece and Cyprus, is self-evident. We avoid geopolitical constraints and we ensure access to European liquid market surpassing transit risks. Also, the energy bridge between the EU and the biggest Arab state, with a notable geopolitical importance, that is Egypt, will be a mutually beneficial strategic development. And what we can explore in the coming years, and this is a personal opinion, is first, a strategic alliance between Egypt, Greece, and Cyprus, and later on, maybe even Libya, on LNG trade. And second, a close cooperation pact on a virtual LNG distribution center aimed mainly at avoiding short-term supply crisis uh, uh, shortages and it should be noted that other countries can join this pact via their FSRUs if deemed feasible. I'm going to conclude in a nutshell the EU may need more than 100 BCM of natural gas after 2030. Eastern Mediterranean is an emerging gas region with substantial resources that could allow stable exports of 30 to 50 BCM on an annual basis. Eastern Mediterranean producers should seek cooperation and synergies from the beginning. Thus, they will become more competitive in the global market. And also, multiple uh, export options should be pursued in parallel from the beginning. The aforementioned scenarios are complementary and not mutually exclusive. And last but not least, multiplicity and regionality are key elements to ensure the timely development of the Eastern Mediterranean gas sources. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you Dr. Phyllis, and I hope my uh, promise to the participants has been fulfilled with this wonderful presentation. Uh, in theory, we have run out of time to allow time for the coffee break, but we'll just try to uh, encroach on the coffee break and take a few minutes for comments and, and questions. I'll ask you all to introduce yourselves before making your comment or your question, and please be brief and to the point uh, focus on one point each, please. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. My name is Khaled Abu Bakr. I'm the chairman of the Egyptian Gas Association, and I'm a board member of uh, uh, the, uh, the executive committee of the International Gas Union. And allow me uh, just to make a couple of remarks that are very important. Um, I'd like to thank you, uh, His Excellency Nicolas Papadopoulos, for his very positive remarks 
on the future of the cooperation and I can answer you and I'm not speaking on behalf of the Egyptian government but I do speak on behalf of the Egyptian gas industry so all the company the multinational and the local I can speak on their behalf in my capacity and I can tell you yes we can deliver with Cyprus and with Greece what you're looking for not only as a regional hub but even beyond this part with our experience, 50 years of experience on gas utilization application, we have the knowledge and the know-how that at a very reasonable cost that we can share with our partners in Greece and Cyprus, and we're ready to do this. And in our uh, very humble expectation, I can see numbers from Cyprus that you expect to use per year one or two BCM. When you produce, we can tell you no, you can even use and consume in your local market three to four BCM with different uh, other application in industry. The absolutely, you are absolutely correct on the stagnant position in Europe. And on that matter, it's very, very important for us to, uh, to have our own comments concerning the European Union energy strategy. The European Union energy strategy that is trying to secure affordable clean energy for the EU citizen. Is it this true? Allow me to say, no, it's not true. The EU energy strategy is working, is only depending on renewable energy. And this is the fatal mistake that will happen. By doing this, they are ruining all the opportunities and all the advantages that your country have discovered on your gas. You need to monetize on the separate gas discover. And in order to monetize on it, you need, of course, the economy of scale. You need to hook it to the Egyptian, Israeli, and other gases. And by doing this, Mr. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Phyllis was just mentioning the different alternative, including Turkey. I totally agree Turkey is, as an option, is a mess because it only allows you to bring your gas to the very stagnant European market. But using the existing LNG facility of Egypt can take this gas beyond even to the Asian market where you really have a higher monetization effect. So um, I'm, I'm really very, very, um, today I'm very uh, optimistic by hearing from such leadership this positive comment. And I can tell you as a gas industry in Egypt, we're totally aligned. And I don't think that the Egyptian government position is different. They, they have declared several times, but we're totally aligned technically, economically, to really make this integration hub. And in the near future, we might see a gas price in the East Mediterranean, not only a virtual gas pricing market, but physical and virtual gas market pricing within the coming five years. Thank you very much for being present here today and sharing your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. I see two requests here for, for comments or uh, questions. Do you want to? Oh. He always has the last word. <laughs> Please, go ahead. Um, thank you very much. My name is Magdi Farahat. I'm currently working on a, an EU project here at the Ministry of Trade and Industry. But the comments I'm going to make are the comments of uh, an Egyptian economist with a rather long history of trade. And my comments are two. One is that the ideas that have been discussed today are excellent. Um, the projects that have been proposed are, seem to be and I stress the word seem because I'm, I, haven't, I haven't seen any, any material, seem to be economically feasible and politically useful. So my first comment would be to have the three universities set up a team to do an in-depth study and propose to the summit something solid so that it, it becomes a, a workable project. My second comment relates to uh, the focus on gas and electricity only, uh, the linking of the grids. Linking of the grids is great, but more importantly is the generation of the electricity itself, in my humble view. With a country like Egypt so full of sun, and as we heard, there were other projects earlier. I remember the Algerian and Moroccan <coughs> projects were proposed a long while ago. It may be time for the three countries, two from the EU and one from the Southern Med, to propose a similar project for uh, um, generation of electricity for use in the EU in the future as well. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, 
uh, with your permission, sir. My name is Jan Tomczyk. Uh, it's not an English name, it's a Polish name, born in the UK. Likewise, I'm working with Dr. Farhat on the trade project in the Ministry of Trade and Industry here in Egypt. Uh, but I very much suspect that I'm the cuckoo in the nest. I think I'm the only oil and gas practitioner in the room. Um, by accident, but not by design, I came here thinking, you know, it wasn't going to be... I didn't know the topic at the time when I came in. I'm a director of the Wood Group, one of their subsidiaries, Wood Group from Aberdeen, one of the largest oil and gas construction companies in the world. And I'm one of the directors of one of their subsidiaries in, in Central Asia. We build most of the installations in Central Asia and Russia and Sakhalin, Baku, Kazakhstan was primarily where I retired from in the oil and gas. So I have about 30 to 40 years experience in oil and gas construction. So my question is this, it's really related more or less to the industry itself, not to the strategic part, but I think Egypt, Greece and Cyprus, you all have one thing to look forward to is developing a strategy for your local content, for your local skills, but also primarily equipment, oil and gas equipment, local content. If you're importing, not the thing to do, right? But you can get those companies to manufacture and do research in country. So you might, you should, I think, consider setting up joint ventures with these large equipment manufacturers in the world. Um, I certainly helped them do that in Azerbaijan and in Kazakhstan and other places. Um, so it's a market that you need to look at now, not until you decide to move the product, because it takes many years to develop those industries from very basic levels. If you're going to build a valve, you need to start with the base plate. You need to find somebody who can manufacture base plates before you can manufacture and assemble the entire Christmas tree. You need to have the technology and the, and the equipment and the skills to develop pipe. Because if you're going to be importing all this undersea pipe, why not manufacture it within the region? That's one option. Um, certainly the Kazakhs are going to do that. You know, um, The other one is skills I want to uh, dwell on for a little while. Um, it takes six to ten years to really get somebody qualified. Why do they need the qualification? Every single company that will operate in gas and oil fields has to have insurance, and they get it from Lloyd's of London. How do they get that? By providing the certificates to the insurance company that all their personnel are skilled and have many, many years' experience. I finished my last project in Kazakhstan because I was the only guy Shell could find with 20 years' experience. So that was my certificate for Lloyd's. So Lloyd's, uh, Shell were covered by, by Lloyd's of London. These are the issues you have to consider to develop your, in, as part of your strategy. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your kind uh, listening. Thank you, attention. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. My name is George Lefferino. I'm a business development consultant. I would like to speak today about sustainable and practical long-term cooperation in this tripartite uh, cooperation. I think we should um, invest in education because it's not enough for the top tier, which is the academia, business people, and politicians to do their work. You have to educate everybody all along the line. In order to do this, we have to invest heavily in education in order to achieve this cooperation. Lack of actual cooperation will result in each of the three countries taking detrimental, hasty, and remote decisions that will increase dr drastically the costs and deviate from the tripartite spirit for communal, long-term, and profitable cooperation. To highlight this point, Mr. Tristan Asprey, the ExxonMobil Exploration Vice President for Europe, Russia, and the Caspian Sea has just proposed 
that Cyprus build an LNG plant. That means that Cyprus is going to forego billions in cost price out of its future income when I wouldn't say brotherly country, but I would say cooperative, tripartite, just across the Med has an LNG. Cooperation means to cooperate, not to everybody goes his own way. As you're probably aware, ExxonMobil and its partner, Qatar, Qatar Petroleum, have won one of the concessions within the Cyprus um, um, exclusive economic zone and to carry out drilling in Block 10 in the second half of 2008. They have asked the Cyprus government to develop local skills through internships and scholarships. The Cyprus Ministry of Energy, Commerce, Industry and Tourism has announced for this year over 1.2 million euros in scholarship. The deadline is 29th of September this year. And we have done nothing to penetrate and cooperate. Furthermore, I would like to discuss the AUC should have an established, it has an established petroleum engineering department. They can seize this magnificently, rewarding to its budget golden opportunity to attract foreign students back to its campus and offer two solutions in the pressing need of Cyprus for local qualified personnel. One is the already engineering certification that they have. The second is the AUC can implement an already designed two-year tailor-made petroleum, natural gas, green energy, engineering major targeting the island's existing engineers irrelevant of specialization. Both of these initiatives will allow AUC to immediately penetrate and take a sustainably developing share of the Cyprus educational petroleum energy market. Extra funding can come from the ANPI um, cooperation for the Mediterranean region and the Juncker plan. Now, the investment offensive by Mr. Jean-Claude Juncker, the president of the EU, was to appropriate 16 billion euros from the EU budget, plus another 5 billion from the European Investment Bank to invest in five industries. One of them is education, and the other is cooperation between the Mediterranean region. We should work really on the academia side to grab these brilliant opportunities and to cooperate so we can avoid the mistakes that the Gulf did. That they had no idea how to use and protect their natural resources and as a result, the big boys got the lion's share of their natural resources. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I wanted to ask the speakers if they have any response, but we're running out of, we're really running out of time. We're 15 minutes late, Magda. So what I'm going to suggest is that the speakers engage the questioners in the coffee break. And uh, Professor Fies, you have a, are you dying to say Just something one, or is it? Yes, I am yeah. a bit anxious to make a much needed uh, clarification and correction because I have been uh, informed uh, by the representative of our embassy that in one of the maps uh, that uh, I presented, um, the, uh, our northern neighbor, uh, that is former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, uh, was presented as Macedonia. This is a very sensitive issue for us. This is uh, are what diplomats for, uh, to uh, watch on the details and uh, make uh, corrections. And therefore, I just wanted to, to say that uh, by accident, the map had uh, uh, the name of Macedonia. We all know that uh, Macedonia is Greek. Uh, it should have been uh, Phyrom, that is the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. Thanks.
the Middle East, we are used to these kind of sensitivities. <laughs> so it's all right. Don't worry. You're in good company. You know, we can go on forever on this. I want to give the last word actually to Dean Fahmy so we can may I, may I go to on the, the same comment? issue. Not on this issue, but on other issues. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for the very uh, interesting uh, suggestions we've heard. May I just say this because we have had a very long discussion regarding the LNG plan on Cyprus, and <clears throat> I think that one of the one of the things that somebody has to take into consideration when taking decisions is to keep your options open. Building a very big, expensive LNG plant remove certain of the options as well as as was mentioned earlier make, directing a pipeline to Turkey removes options the Egypt option doesn't do that it keeps our options open to examine further uh, options in the future so again this is something that makes perfect sense when you're formulating a, a strategy and I think that something that was said by Mr. Tomasik I think is very important that you have, must have long-term planning regarding all these issues to create the local skill needed to make this endeavor uh, viable in the future. And just to conclude, I, I would like to say this. I'm, I have faith that, yes, the Egyptian uh, gas industry can provide these types of services, and they can take up the, the reserves for Cyprus and give us these options that we do require at this point. And I think that such cooperation would indeed trigger further economic development, both in Cyprus and in Egypt as well. And uh, my late father, as uh, president of Cyprus, signed the first uh, demarcation agreement with Egypt in 2003. Nothing would give me greater pleasure and honor if I would be so honored as President of Cyprus to sign the first commercial agreement with Egypt. Always a good sign of an excellent politician to uh, create a, a good, a good, a good uh, board. And we will all be invited to, to a signing ceremony, won't we? Definitely. So we get, we get another, we'll get a promise from you now when, before you become President. <laughs> Let me call on Dean Fahmy then to give us some final remarks and, uh, and to comment on this session. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. I was very impressed by the content and the specific proposals made uh, by the experts here. I'm not going to get into a process of analyzing what they said or what they didn't. They know more about the details than I do. Uh, let me just make two or three quick comments. One, and this is what Mr. Tomasek said, it's very important in my mind, uh, as we look at the cooperation, that we not only look at the natural resource, but also look at the technology transfer in the process and how we can expand our industries that relate to the energy sector. Uh, we, we're not looking at simply being a source of gas or oil, or for that matter, only being a source of electricity. That would be very beneficial, but it's much more useful if we can generate cooperation throughout the industry. My second point is I think the idea of cooperating between universities at the scholarly level and between the technical technicians as well is important. I won't speak on behalf of the engineering, uh, School of Science and Engineering at AUC, but I know they have an impressive uh, petroleum department. But let me suggest not only that we look at master's degrees that they offer, but let me suggest even to them to look at what possible executive training programs can be developed that have a solid academic foundation for a shorter term process. Not everybody wants to come and spend two years but many would actually find benefit from spending six months to a year of intensive training and getting a certificate in that respect as well. That's over and above, of course, uh, utilizing whatever is available from the EU to uh, develop scholarly cooperation and student exchange. My last point is a question, really, and I will take the answer at, uh, over the coffee. It's to Mr. Phyllis, really. The, the, it was mentioned that 
besides the cooperation, we could cooperate on dealing with energy crisis. Could you elaborate a little bit on that later? Uh, and are we talking about supply of energy or supply of electricity or some other kind of crisis and what kind of mechanism uh, do you have in mind on that? Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean Fahmy, and uh, with that, I thank the uh, speakers, I thank the participants, and I invite you all to a 10-minute coffee break. Thank you.